Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the June 18th, 2019 Council Committee meeting. My name is Stephanie Meyer, Council President and a Council Member from Ward 3, and I will be chairing this meeting. Besides myself, the committee members here tonight are Matt Zimmerman of Ward 1, Jim Neighbor, Ward 1, Eric Jenkins, Ward 2, Mike Kemling, Ward 2, Lisa Larson Bennell, Ward 3, Mickey Sandifer, Ward 4, and Lindsay Constance, Ward 4. Before we begin our agenda, I'd like to explain our procedures for public input. During the meeting, I will offer the opportunity for public input. If you would like to speak to the committee at any of those times, please go to the podium and I will ask that you state your name and address for the record and then you may offer your comments. So that the audience can hear you, I would ask that you speak directly into the microphone. And by policy, your comments are limited to five minutes. After you are finished, please sign the form on the podium to ensure we have an accurate record of your name and address. There are two items on tonight's agenda. The first item is the budget overview of the 2019 R2020 budget workshop. Uh, this budget discussion is to review a proposal by council members Jen Jenkins and Kemling. And we had a chat earlier, Eric and I, and I think we decided you will open with some comments. And then what we're going to do just for everyone's edification here is we'll work through the recommendations uh, one by one through the proposal at that point. So I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Stephanie. Welcome to everybody that's here. We do have some public here tonight, and I appreciate that. You guys have come out and listen to what we're trying to do. Um, this is a, a concept that was drawn up uh, with, by me and uh, Mike Kemling jointly, trying to come up with some ideas on how we can address what we feel is some of the most serious issues in Shawnee, and it does affect our budget in a pretty significant way. I didn't just talk to Mike. I did talk to a couple of uh, citizens as well and got their input uh, on the process. So. I wanted to reach out and get as much input as I could before we went ahead and moved in this direction. But the, uh, the subject matter is the, the storm drain, storm sewers in this community, the pipes, the old pipes that are getting in pretty bad shape, some of them uh, as much as 50 years old. And I appreciate the information that was provided to us by the Director of Public Works, and there's been actually uh, a substantial amount of effort uh, has been put in. And some of it's been a little expensive, getting all that videotaping done to the inside of those pipes and trying to determine how bad the problem really is. And we're at a point now uh, where we have a, a pretty good handle on where we stand as far as the uh, deterioration of our infrastructure uh, as it relates to stormwater pipes. Um, Doug Whitaker, our public works director, gave us a couple of briefings on this subject. One of those, we talked about the 20 years and the other one talked about 10 years out. The 20 year thought was that it may cost as much as $200 million uh, to get everything back on a good footing where we've got a sound infrastructure system for handling stormwater. Uh, more recently, he briefed us on a 10-year projection, and we were looking at somewhere between 100 and $140 million to address uh, repairs to repair the deteriorating system. We have, we have divided them into five categories uh, in the way we've done the analysis and uh, rate. Our pipes are now rated from a scale of five down to one, five being the very worst and in a state of deterioration where they could, they're in imminent collapse condition. It could be just any time um, down to one, which is in pretty good shape, obviously. But uh, the, the fives and the fours are actually quite a cause for concern. And when you got the budget that we have here in Shawnee, it's, uh, it's going to be a real difficult issue to address that kind of need in the next 10 years, to come up with an extra $100, $140 million. Um, I, mean, I came up with a few ideas. I did bounce them off. Um, the city manager and the director of public works. One of those being that uh, had an idea that maybe we could form a public task force, a, a city task force, that would address this issue. We'd have some in-house capability to go out and address the uh, the repairs to these systems. And uh, I don't know if we could or could not save money doing that. And I uh, I talked to Doug about that, Doug Whitaker about that, and said, hey, over the next year, would it be possible to take a look at this concept of if we decided to do it ourselves and we were going to hire some people? on a temp basis or interim basis and get perhaps even acquire some equipment or lease some equipment to go out and do this kind of work, would it be cost beneficial? Is that better than, would that be cheaper and we could get more miles out of it than we could by just contracting it out as we always have in the past? And uh, so that's still up for debate. We don't know if that's going to be a good thing or not because obviously Doug's only had a couple of weeks to even, oh, maybe a week to even think about that so far. So obviously I'm not expecting anything back from them at this point in time. But we did allow for the whole 2020 budget year to, to process that and try to come up with some some uh, ideas and what we might be able to do in that regard. If it come turns out that no, that wouldn't be better, then we can we don't have to go there. That's that's easy. That's a no-brainer. We don't just don't go there. 
Uh, it, I've even thought that perhaps we could even hire a contractor to be our go-to contractor. That's our guy or, or whoever. We got him on kind of retainer basis and they can go out and do this. Because I do worry a little bit about the ones that just collapse on you out of the blue. You don't have any warning that those are going to happen. And then what kind of flexibility do you have if you don't have any resources handy, if you have to go through the bidding process and all that to address these ones that are that are collapsing either prematurely or just a, a kind of surprise gotcha type of thing. So there's some advantages to having the system under our control instead of having to go out and individually um, contract them, but I await their, their recommendation on that. Um, I also felt that it should be incorporated into our capital improvements plan as part and parcel to it. I mean, you'll see stormwater projects on a capital improvement plan, but I'm talking about this having this restoration project as a as a concept on the CIP, where we address it as a program, essentially, start to finish to get the, to get it up to standards. And that way, it's it's front and center as we do our budget deliberations. We look at what our comprehensive plan, uh, what we want to do in our comprehensive plan, and how much money we have, and how much we can afford. That would be up there front where we can we'd be looking at it and be in our mindset all the time. So I just thought it'd be a, a good thing to have it on the uh, in the capital improvements plan. I do not want to see a tax increase. I've uh, talked to thousands of people in this community in the last couple of years, and there's a, a very strong uh, position by most of our citizens that they don't want any tax increases. And frankly, I concur with that. I don't want any tax increases either. So I guess I'm on the same page with them. I want to be able to do this out of existing funds by perhaps shifting some funds, maybe change some prioritization of some of the projects and that kind of thing. Um, we would like to see the maximum amount of funding possible be uh, moved over to infrastructure repair. And uh, although we greatly appreciate our parks and all that, I'm, I'm looking at putting a moratorium on park spending out of the general fund until we get this corrected. Now, I very specifically said out of the general fund that uh, there's three different pots that uh, funds our park system already, that uh, the liquor sales tax, parks and pipes, and there's another tax on, on new developments in the community where some of that's set aside for a future acquisition of parkland. So there is a significant amount of money already allocated to parks, but as far as boosting the park with any additional from the general fund uh, during this process, I don't think we're gonna, we would really be able to do that. Um, I think about it, there's a possibility we could even look at the uh, the budget reserves. We have a pretty substantial reserve in this city, and if we need to jumpstart this project, and I'm thinking kind of in terms if we if uh, Mr. Whitaker comes back with a concept that would cost cost us upfront some money, but it would in the long term it would be very helpful to us to do it ourselves. And if we need to front end load it, that'd be an opportunity. That'd be the time we'd want to do something like that, reach into our uh, reserves in order to fund that up front, just get it kickstarted and running. And that'd be when we might want to do, think about this, some bonding as well, some exercise some bonding authority. So that's, um, that's some of the ideas I'd come up with to do this. And then I um, put together a uh, list of recommendations. And I think um, we wanted to look at the recommendations on an individual basis. Mm -hmm. And we so, might, you might go through these strategies as well as a few of them I think are that you've covered already are probably worthy. If, Okay, I can go. Yeah. I can go over, and then I don't. You want to go through all of them, and then come back and do a one by one on one, one by one, or how do you want to work? Uh, why don't we start with the strategies, and then we'll go down to the recommendations. So we'll do the first six that you just covered, if that works okay, for you. Well, I was looking. Those were strategies that I just provided. So those were the six strategies. Right. So I assumed you wanted council to discuss whether or not they wanted to move forward with those six strategies. We do want to. I mean, they're part and parcel to accomplishing what we got below on the record. They tied to the recommendations, so. Okay, we can whichever way you would like. And, and the last item would be the first. I, I did prepare a resolution as well mm -hmm. that I would like to see the council adopt, which basically just focuses that as a priority of, on, on our drainage system and a repair of our infrastructure, and just elevates it to a priority status officially. And that, that says that we are uh, in concert together. That yes, we recognize this is a big problem. We're going to go after it. And we're going to do everything we can to correct it in a, as reasonable amount of time as possible. So, um, I don't know, it's kind of a toss up whether we want to go straight to recommendations <laughs> or. Feel free to go over the last if you want to go all the way through your proposal before we start discussion. Okay, well I'll go through some recommend okay. the recommendations. I think that way we can um, discuss it all as one package sure. and 
take it apart, tear it up, do whatever you want to do. But uh, my first recommendation, now getting down to the actual recommendations, was to form a citizen task force to review the 2019 and 2020 budget. What the purpose to ascertain where the cost savings could be derived in a 2021 budget. Obviously, if we do that, we need to start it pretty soon because, you know, we don't want to start well, we actually enter the budget cycle. We want, to, we want to start that early on, and that way by the time we get to the budget cycle, they would have something to give us in terms of what they felt could be some of the savings. We would look at the suggestion would be for each council person to nominate two citizens to participate in the process. The committee would meet under the aegis of the city manager, and, the two, and two council persons will also be selected to work on the committee to uh, go through the process with the citizen group. So they would have uh, two city council persons under as well. City participation in our budgetary process, I feel would be a positive action. The citizens task force that was put together to look at the reconstitution of our roads and established priorities was extremely successful. And it served us very well in our comprehensive street repair program. It's helped us identify who's the priority. It gave us a, a capability of rank ordering things and figuring out how we want to go about it. I think that was very useful when we were in the budgetary process and and the, in the allocation process. So I'd like to see something similar to that uh, as one of my first recommendations. Second recommendation was to be in conjunction with the citizen task force, uh, city staff will work to achieve an overall 3% reduction in the budget for 2021. These savings will be sequestered for the purpose of applying these funds to the restoration of stormwater systems. So I don't think we'll be looking at public safety you guys are kind of sacrosanct on that regard, but there, when we look at the uh, more administrative functions of the city on that side of the house uh, to try to achieve these 3% savings, that would not be really savings, they'd be redirected funds to go to, to uh, help boost our, our ability to address this problem. Um, unless there's no uh, resident expertise on the city staff, we're gonna curtail uh, future planning and go with uh, in-house planning. And I've talked to a number of city staff about this that seem to have a pretty good a reception that we would start doing a, a lot of the planning we're contracting out now we start doing it internally um, such as the master planning and the you know, revised comprehensive plan and those kind of things we have a tremendous amount of capability on our staff and i and i also discussed with them the fact we probably would have to hire a temp person that would be the point of contact so they would be the person that actually would assemble it all i don't know how many of you guys have been involved in some of these planning processes but i've been in a bunch of them haven't been in the government for a a long time and it takes up a lot of staff time anyway they, they're you're briefing them all the time and you're reviewing what they've done so far and you're pretty well integrated in any way i'd say why don't we just do it and uh and get somebody that can actually that's got the talents to actually put it together and put it in the proper format and publish it uh which instead of being through 250,000, maybe we could bring it in for 170 for 75,000, something like that it'd be a substantial savings that would be useful to apply to other the other things such as this uh, I mentioned above in one of the strategies, but here it becomes one of the recommendations to begin a moratorium on all general fund competition contributions to new parks or recreational facilities until our infrastructure is in an adequate state of repair. And the final item being to adopt the resolution recognizing the restoration of the stormwater management infrastructure of the city of Shawnee as a priority goal of our budgetary process until the infrastructure can be brought to an adequate level of repair. Um, it's not very exciting doing stormwater repair, a lot more fun doing some other stuff, but um, just like it's no fun spending money to get new tires for your car or replacing the washing machine because it broke down and those kind of things. But unfortunately, these these things just won't wait. You can't postpone them. They're going to they're gonna go to pot whether you like it or not. So we've got to move forward and start having something that's, we've got to be able to react to it effectively and get something done within a, a reasonable period of time. So those are the recommendations and like just to open it up for the council to discuss. Sure. Okay. Well, then we will go ahead and just kick things off and start with the strategies list. So the first item open for discussion will be the idea of the establishment of a stormwater infrastructure construction task force. Uh, Matt, looks like you're first up. So um, I, I'm going to start by say, first saying, um, I, I do concur with the, the notion that this is an urgent matter to be resolved. And, uh, and I like some of the creative solutions, by the way. Um, with regards to standing up our own heavy construction uh, unit, I got a, 
a, a lot of concerns about that. Um, even even from the concept of just just trying to figure out the the, the logistics and the costs of creating that that special task force, um, excavating equipment is is extraordinarily expensive. You've got different kinds of, of pipe repairs to do, so you're not going to be able to use a one size fits all piece of equipment. Um, and then you get into a challenge of when you bring in a subcontractor, what kind of equipment do you want to invest in? There's maintenance costs of the equipment, storage costs, um, insuring the equipment. Um, it's it's expensive, and I'm not sure that we have the expertise to even, as a city, even get our arms around the inventory of equipment that we would have to use to get all the work done. Footnote, getting all the work done, it's my understanding we're about, and I'm looking at, at Doug Whitaker to see if he'll confirm this, I think we're about 60, 65% of the way through the assessment of all of our pipes in terms of videotaping. So we're a little over halfway. Um, so I don't think we have enough information to even begin that process. Beyond just the equipment, I think that the toughest thing is going to be recruiting the skilled trades. And I've been in, in construction for 36 years. And skilled trades, good skilled trades, is always uh, a challenge to, to get. In the next four to five years, one of the largest projects in Kansas City is the KCI airport, and that is going to suck down that resource big time. Um, and it's kind of seasonal, so that, that comes with its own brand of, of challenge. I'm not sure the city wants to get wrapped up into that. Part and parcel of the skilled trades is what does that do to insurance? Um, contractors, when it comes to insurance and, and how they rank it, they have an EMR rating. You have one bad accident, and that's going to mess up the insurance rates, for the, possibly for the entire city. It's a risk I'm not sure we want to take. We can push that off on a contractor, and then it's their problem. And then there's the whole issue of, of bonding. When we have a, a stormwater repair project, we put it out for bid. We're going to get competitive bids from people with estimating teams that, that really know how to estimate this stuff good um, competitively. And then we can hold them to it with performance and payment bonds. We can put bid bonds on them. And if it's a critical job, we can hit them with liquidated damages or any kind of a penalty clause or on the flip side of an incentive clause. And as a city, we just won't be able to have that, that those checks and balances for ourselves. And we didn't talk about it, but I'm assuming that there would be an engineering component for, the, for all of this. I'm not sure how, how that's going to fit in, whether we're going to insource that in the city. And, and if we do, how do we handle insurance on errors and omissions and that kind of thing? Um, there's some other stuff here, Eric and, and Mike. Um, again, I appreciate the, the creative solution approach. I agree that it's a priority. I think. I, I strongly think we need to keep that piece of the of the solution in the hands of private business and keep it in the competitive bid environment. But that's uh, that's that's my two cents worth. Eric, yeah, I respect your opinion on that. You've been in the business a lot longer than I have because I've never been in that business. So that's one day is longer than what I've had. <laughs> so my concept on this was to, to have some control over because. But I, when I listen to you, though, I, I still have some things clicking in my mind, like. Okay, we're going to pay for that anyway because the contractor is not going to waiver those costs that he has of heavy equipment and staffing and all the issues he's got. And if he's he's going to be competing for those same people we could be competing for as they build the airport out there. Um, so is he, how's he going to flesh out his people, whoever our contractor is? Maybe they'd rather go up there more. So you're going to have some of those. You're going to have those competitive problems anyway. I think we're going to have some, a lot of these problems anyway. And he makes a profit, sometimes a fairly significant profit. I would like to be the one making the profit in the city because I can apply that toward more work. So I'm not saying it is feasible, but I would really would like to give it an honest shot as far as looking at it and saying, okay, let's flesh it out and say, 
what are the ins and outs and is it impossible? That's why I left it wide open. Obviously, we're not going to go there if it's not something we can do. I think I saw Lisa and then Jim. Um, again, I want to echo what Council Member Zimmerman said. I'm really excited to see this really out of the box thinking from what we've seen before. And um, I agree, I think, with the rest of the council that stormwater management is an incredibly important issue that deserves a lot of attention. With this particular recommendation, um, I had sort of two thoughts in addition to what Matt said. One is that right now we have the ability to leverage different companies against each other to get um, a better rate. The other thing that we have the ability to do right now is hire five companies at once to do a lot of different projects at once. And as soon as we take all of this in-house, we are going to lose that ability to really spread throughout the city. Um, one thing that I heard you say I thought was an excellent idea is having a potential master agreement with a contractor. So do a very large competitive bid for a contractor that will say for the next five years, these are all the projects or we, we can work on how we define it, but these are all the projects and let's see who can come up with the best bid. I think that might be a good um, middle ground approach. Jim? Yeah, I, uh, Lisa, that's a very good point. I agree with what Matt said. Uh, the one thing, just going back to simplistically, um, I, I am not in the business. I, I don't think the city needs to be in the heavy equipment construction business. There are many very, very capable companies throughout the city um, and in the nation that can take care of this. Um, and just simplistically, I go back to the fact uh, when I got on the council 10 years ago, we were mowing all the grass in the city. And we had lawnmowers, we had people and all this. And in about five years ago, we turned around and said, let's go and contract this out. And in retrospect, it has been cheaper, it has been more efficient, it gets done on time, and the costs to us, and again, the manpower and uh, FTEs ha has improved because if we hire all these people, what do they do in the winter when they can't work on the stormwater? And the other part is, when, and so much of this stormwater stuff that we're doing, and, and like Doug said, we've got 60% of it, so they've got a pretty good idea where the bad spots are and, and can do it. But a lot of this, they don't have to dig it up. They can go in and use a completely different uh, technology, just go in and reline the pipes with uh, fiber and things like that that gives them the strength. So uh, it, it, it's a huge issue and problem. Uh, agreeably, I think it needs to be taken care of. I remember just when Doug got here, the two or, th two or three meetings into there, he came up and made that stormwater presentation and we were just talking about uh, roads, and I thought, oh my goodness, that number is a lot bigger than roads, and we need to take care of it. But I think that uh, they've exhibited we have a handle on it. I think we can anticipate and work through it. We've had no catastrophic failures recently, uh, but it does need to be a, uh, come a priority, and I, I think that there are a number of points that Eric and Mike have brought up that uh, we can consider like with CIP and other things uh, moving forward. Mickey? I have to agree with, with the other council members that have spoken. Um, our family used to own a construction company. We did storm drainage. We've, we've done a lot of this. To come in and start a company up and buy the equipment and hire the help, you're talking at millions and millions of dollars to get started because you have to buy so, so many different pieces of equipment. Then to hire the, the individuals, you're not going to get individuals to run this very high dollar equipment for thirty, forty thousand dollars a year. These are going to be anywhere from from seventy five to one hundred and ten thousand dollars a year employees. You know, these aren't cheap employees. They have to be qualified and they have to stay qualified. This is a, this is specialty stuff. Now we're talking about engineers. A lot of the uh, construction companies. We always had an in house engineer and in house architects. We had all of this going. You know. The city is strapped the way it is with, with the engineering engineers and, and that we have here now. All of our staff, if, if we, they're not sitting around looking at each other. I mean, these guys are busy all the time, and, and they're, we, we load them up with more work. We're going to, you know, you don't hire a temp. You have to hire full-time staff again. So you're, any way you look at this, you're, you're, constant, you're, you're adding a constant increase in anywhere from employment to insurance, as, as was told. And to, as of starting another business, as 
I mean, then you're limited for the for as many uh, jobs that you can get done at a certain period of time, as was said by Lacey. You, uh, you're taken away from the ability to hire four or five contractors at a time if you had a catastrophe or something that was going on. So uh, I'm in agreement with the other council members. Eric. Yeah, I recognize a lot of comments are being made, and I think a lot of the comments are very valid. The uh, the proposal was for cost savings. And if it didn't result in cost savings, obviously we just pitch it out automatically. But if it was, if Doug came back with a report and said, yeah, this would be pretty pricey on the front end, but when you're stuck in a project of $100 million, we think we could do this project for $70 million if we did it ourselves, that would have been pretty attractive that we could save $30 million if we could get to our goal a lot sooner, thereby freeing up funds for other projects we, we also desire to do and make that available to ourselves. So, yeah, I'm not crazy about hiring additional people. I'm not crazy about building staffs and that kind of thing. I think uh, Matt had some really good comments on the um, on the side about the liabilities and those kind of things. I think are really pretty significant. And that's why it was I left the door wide open at the end of my suggestion that if it doesn't work, we don't do it, obviously, you know. So, uh, I don't know if we make a cost savings or not. That was the whole purpose, was to, get, to save money, not to give ourselves a whole lot more headaches. Because it would be a lot more headaches. So that's fair to be said. Lindsay. I just had a couple of questions for Eric and Mike about your research in doing this. The first, is this something that other cities had done that, looked, that you looked at that gave you the idea? So are there examples? And then the second one, maybe I missed it in the beginning, but what was the take of our public works department and whether we think it would be helpful or a burden or we don't know yet because it's just right at the beginning. Okay. On the second question, it was we don't know yet. And uh, I think city manager and director of public works were just receptive. They just listened and said, yeah, okay. You know, they kind of kicked that around and we'll get back to you. And, and I made it, that's why I gave them a very long period of time to, to kind of go over it. And so you don't have to drop everything and get Eric an answer. You know, it's like you got a year just over this next year kind of, look into it, kind of probe around, see what you think. And if something positive comes out of it, great. If something positive doesn't come out of it, obviously we don't go there. So that was kind of a simple little solution there. As far as whether other communities are doing or not, um, couldn't tell you. All I know is I spent 34 years in the United States Army. We used a lot of task forces and we kicked butt and took names. And we threw these things together from a variety of different sorted units and personnel and put them together and moved out smartly and won the war. So. You know, I kind of, I guess that's my military background that kind of brings that into my mind that we could form this task force. It may not translate here, and I'm cognizant of that, okay? But that concept of forming up a team that could go out and be very responsive to getting this done and perhaps result in a significant savings was an attractive thought. It may not be achievable, but it was an attractive thought, and I thought it was worth bouncing off our guys and say, hey, folks, what do you know? What, what do you think? And that's where I'm at with it is all. If I don't, if we don't do this, I'm not going to go get a beer and cry in it, guys. It's really not. It was, it was, like you said, take it out of the box, trying to find some ideas and throw them out there and see what we can do. Because we're, we're in a situation here which is pretty serious. And uh, I don't think we're going to get it with our pea shooters. We've got to bring out some big guns to get some of these things solved. So the idea may not work, but it's an idea. It's something I would, I would like to see just some kind of uh, final closure to it. That, yeah, I, if, if Doug comes back and says, you know, we, we can't spend that much staff time doing it. Wow, well, okay. We can't spend that much staff time doing it. If he comes back and says, hey, we did look at it. It doesn't work. Okay, it, didn't, it doesn't work. I fully respect the, the, the findings of our guys and what they did. But I thought it was worth taking a look at. I didn't feel there's any harm in doing that, for sure. Mickey? The other part that I was thinking about of, of the city taking this, this task on was when you're using contracting services, they have to guarantee it anywhere from the architects to the engineers to the to the actual workers. You know, you're starting up a fresh team or you're trying to put something together. There's going to be mistakes, and all it takes is is a couple two or three million dollar mistakes to to eat up as for say you would you would think would be profit or or something that would go on to another job. You could you could actually end up uh, costing yourself more money than what it would cost, take you for to get the contract done. So. Oh, that's possible. Lisa. 
I think what's really important for us to do is to give staff both the direction and the license to think as creatively as possible about how to tackle this issue. So I agree. I wouldn't want your idea to be taken off the table because it's worth exploring a little bit, at least to get started. I think it's a great starter idea. I want staff to think out of the box. I want them to think creatively and I want them to come to us with ideas that we haven't considered before about how to tackle this issue. So I think for me, that's the most important message to send from this strategy. Matt. So, uh, Doug, I'm gonna put you on the spot, sorry. <laughs> Do you and your staff, what's your comfort level and how much time do you think it's gonna take to do a, a this is basically, this is a, a, a business evaluation um, and you're doing it for a city of 67,000 people. Is this is this a back of a napkin? I know it's not a back of a napkin thing, but is do you have enough information about all of the different types of repairs out there that you can that you're comfortable doing this? Is this a two week process? Is this a, a one year process? Give us some feedback. Sorry, and if you're coming to the mic, yes. Spot, <laughs> but you are. Doug Whitaker, Public Works Director. It's, I mean, I've, I've been out in construction business before. I mean, is it, it's, it would be a monumental task. I'm not going to, you know, deny that. Can we take it to a point, you know, the initial phase and just see what comes together? I mean, there's a lot of the, a lot of the stuff right up front that we could probably look at is, is just what's the liability and those type things right off the bat. If that takes off, then obviously there would be, you know, the, what the city would, could be held liable for, you know, from that standpoint like that. Yeah. Those expenses, that would be the overhead expenses coming out. Equipment, yeah, I've talked to my fleet manager out there. He knows all the different equipment and like that. How much we'd have to have, we'd have to sit down and, you know, it would take a while. It's not something I can say right now that it will work or it won't work. I mean, I have all the questions that everyone, you know, is listed up here. We'd have to determine all of that. So, I mean, it would take some time. I'd have to work with, you know, Nolan and, and see what we could, you know, what we could put together um, from that, you know, and just talk with my staff. I, there's, you know, I know there's some knowledgeable people, you know, very knowledgeable in the staff that we could just kind of get some ideas out of it. But then, you know, then we could make that determination as to whether we proceed, you know, get into it any deeper and really try to put it together, if that makes sense. Yeah, makes sense. It, it, again, it, it's a daunting task. Yeah. Um, in the spirit of of not quashing creativity, and, and to Lisa's point, um, y'all are very busy. I, don't, I would I would hate for you to to commit a whole lot of time to this just just because my gut feel is as creative as it is. There's this isn't the right approach. However. Fairness to Eric and to Mike for, for the efforts they put into it and in the spirit of Lisa's comments. There's something you can do in terms of, of at what point do we kind of hit this go, no go? Is, is, it, is it the risk management piece as an example? Um, I'm looking for the minimum amount of work that gets us to a point where we can say, okay, we've got enough information at this point that to spend to spend any more time beyond this is, is counterproductive. And you, and you don't have to answer that right now. You can sleep on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think, just to jump ahead, I think before we task staff with taking on a monumental task, which I think it would be, I think we all appreciate the ideas. We need to decide whether philosophically getting into the construction business and We've heard a lot of folks who have issue with competing with private industry. I have some trepidation about that piece of this as well, whether this is a philosophical direction that we want to head in before we have staff spend an arduous amount of time on this issue as well. So, and Eric. You know, just a follow-up comment to Doug. It, as you get into it, in my opinion, if you would have got into it, whether we go into it or not, I guess we're up to council's opinion on that. 
but as you started getting your staff together, and you said you have some pretty knowledgeable people on this staff, and that's a good thing. As you got into it, you might say, you know, we don't really want to get into the, the super heavy stuff, like the big culverts, the big boxes, and all that kind of but, You know, we could do some, we could set up a smaller task force, which would be supplemental to our contracted work, where we could address these smaller pipes and stuff, and we could knock those suckers out, you know, and with a, with a team that we could put together. So I'm just throwing it out there as just a, an adjunct thought. I mean, there may be some things, good things generated out of you guys just taking a good look at this and saying, you know, let's, let's think outside the box. Let's just throw it out there and see what what lands, you know. And, uh, wow, something might come out of it. Maybe you should get a couple of good ideas or something that does work and doesn't put us in any kind of deep jeopardy and this kind of thing. It doesn't require huge amounts of equipment. It may be only a supplemental to the other process or something along those lines. But and by taking a look at it, I think we give ourselves an opportunity to, to seek out some savings and some uh, and some good ideas. Mickey and then Jim. Uh, if some of our staff and employees have already been changing some of the storm drainage that we have, haven't they? So we're already doing some of that. We already we have that in play right now. And that's not something that they're doing the little stuff. Jim. Yeah, I and respectfully, Eric. Um, I, I appreciate the idea. I think the staff we have on is tasked running the city and doing the engineering and public work things that we have going on right now. And this is going to, number one, things are going to start falling through the cracks. And I am not comfortable taking and throwing something up against the wall and see if it sticks to get this done. I think we probably have, our, our, our staff is, is pretty much done. I would like I would like some of these answers, but there are other priorities that are extremely important as far as our city that cannot fall by the wayside just because, yes, we got stormwater uh, and, and, and Doug has gone through and they've x-rayed or videotaped 60% of it. I think they have a pretty good idea and there's a lot of expertise of what is, what is going to fail, when it might fail and things. But I do not believe that the city should get in the stormwater repair business again. There are very competent contractors out there that do that. And again, when they come in with stormwater, they have consistently bids have been below what the city engineer had estimated. I, I would just quickly agree with what uh, Jim said regarding um, just taking on this private industry and growing the local government for the sake of competing with private. And I would uh, prefer, I, kind of, I think the idea of having a master agreement with maybe a couple of contractors so we have more than one available at our, our disposal might be a more amenable path. So Lisa and then Mickey. I was just going to piggyback on what you were saying. Philosophically, this is competing with local business when we do this. And it's not that we can never compete with local businesses, but we need to be very thoughtful about when we're doing that. And we need to seriously consider, since these are such large dollars, the actual economic impact that might have on our city. Mickey. And also, uh, paperwork that I got together today was that right now, at this time, we have 50, like 5.8 million, or I believe, through the year for stormwater. Was that correct? I believe it's right in there. 4.4. 4. 4. 4. 4.4 million a year right now that we're using for stormwater at this time that's, that's coming in through the stormwater tax and other entities that are, that are feeding the fund. And I would say within the 10 year period that, that this is also going to be increasing. So within the 10 year period, you're probably looking just a ballpark in the, in the ballpark of between 50 and $60 million coming in within the 10 year period that's already coming in at this point, you know, so that's going to be coming in and is that, if that makes sense to anybody, but so we're not, we're not destitute on this, this feature and we are working on it and we're, and we're keeping up with it at this moment. For purposes of moving on from item one, um, it sounds like maybe we, are passing on this idea for now? Is that we're, I'm happy to do a vote on each, if you all would like. How, yeah, how do you want to handle? Sure, we can, why don't we, for the sake of simplicity, we can just vote on whether or not we want to move a proposal forward. So uh, I, I will take a vote 
All those in favor of moving strategy number one forward, say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. 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 Sounds like we have a majority. Uh, so I will, majority in the negative, that is. So we will table item one. Uh, item two is to move the stormwater infrastructure projects to the capital improvement plan for the city. Um, I would open that up. I would just a point of clarification. Typically, our capital improvement plan has included projects that are funded, correct? So this would be a departure from the norm on that. Just to, yeah. Lisa. So this was really similar to the comments that um, Council Member Jenkins made a few meetings ago that I concurred with insofar as we need more transparency with what's going on with this. We need more regular reports and we need to have a better handle on it so that we can be responsive to our constituents when they make questions. Um, one of the things I have been thinking about is how we have graded our stormwater um, pipes and how we are determining which should be dealt with first. So um, these level five, I think is what they're calling them, are the ones that are bad and they're probably gonna collapse soon. But um, I think what we need to know is what is the impact of that collapse going to be? So if that collapse happens in somebody's backyard, that is a different impact than if the collapse happens at the corner of Shawnee Mission Parkway and Culvera. So um, I would really like to see from staff a monthly report that will rank projects by a combination of likelihood of failure and the impact of failure, and that will sh give us progress on each of those. Now, this would be a living document. Um, again, I, to Stephanie's point, I didn't feel like it was a perfect fit in the... Um, capital improvement plan, but we do need more transparency on this. And I recommended this to Nolan earlier and he thought that it could maybe work. I'd like to have Doug kind of address some of the things they're working on in terms of that asset management system and the, and the rating Great. of the pipe. And I think after speaking with Councilmember Jenkins following that uh, CIP meeting, I think kind of what and feel free to, I don't want to speak for you, kind of looking at similar to kind of what we provide for the mill and overlay program, the street rating system, and so having something along those lines uh, for the stormwater management programs. Great. As, as you remember, again, Doug Whitaker, Public Works Director, as you remember when the county was in and gave that update on how the new SMAC program and all is going, they are also implementing a, an overall asset management for the county system of which we would feed our data into that. And then they're using that, you know, the risk versus how much, you know, the, you know, the probability and then the risk uh, in each case. And we have been experimenting with that. When I say experimenting, working with, we have our, what is it now, our Esri GIS system that uh, our Doug Hemsaf, another Doug, um, that is you know, managing that, we actually are starting to incorporate into that database that it can do those calculations and spit out the pipes that exactly give what you're, you're doing. We're in the initial stages, because I think he went to the national conference for Esri and they kind of showed that and he's been working on it. And I know working with my stormwater manager and like that, so we can try to you know, pull that together and improve that. I mean, I know we know where the, like I said, the 52 per 58 percent of the pipes that we videoed. I mean, we know where they are and you know the conditions and everything like that. But we've gone that next step, and in fact, some of ours have started to match up with the counties. You know, there's kind of that issue of pulling it all together, and the county has been doing some extensive work with a consultant that for them on how to calculate all that too within their asset management database. So I think we're taking the steps to get there so that we can manage it. So how long? Well, I'll have to get you an answer on that because <laughs> I don't know where they are and I don't want to commit them to. More or less than a year. Oh, I think we've got some of the data right now. So I mean, you know, and actually have spit some of that information out. So let me, you know, let me, let me get an answer back to city manager and we can send it out. So I would love I would love some specificity behind this and I would love this to be transparent and I think all of the council members need to be held accountable for this and we need to be able to have good answers that are well informed. Okay. Matt? Yes, that, that whole concept, I, I strongly support it. Um, Lisa, your comment about 
there's the there's the issue of the of the health of the pipe itself is it going to fail but a huge part of that is where's the pipe located because if the pipes to your example you know Shawnee Mission Parkway and Quivera that's a really high priority so yeah getting that <clears throat> and if you know Eric you're, you're I think your primary idea here is to put the spotlight on this, give this a, a top priority. I think that fits right into that. Mm -hmm. We have some structure around it. Yeah. So are we good with deferring to the monthly reporting in lieu of the CIP? Awesome. Okay. We will do that. Item three uh, is really more of a policy position. Um, regarding not wanting to see a tax increase. I think we probably all agree on that one. So <laughs> I could take a vote, but I think we're good. Uh, so item four uh, is priority uh, towards the stormwater, which I think um, there's a little more information regarding parks and rec, which is covered in your recommendation. So I might just skip that one since we will address it in a few moments. Yes. Uh, items five and six, uh, in, in my mind, I suppose, are somewhat grouped together. So it's the concept of perhaps looking at our uh, bonding availability, which I think will be the 2021, 22 year when we have the availability, uh, or also looking at using some of our city reserves to help bring stormwater up to speed. So, Matt. So I think we really need to explore that. I think those are worthy of, of further investigation. I, there's no numbers in here, of course, but, and, and it's all preliminary, but absolutely it's worth some investigation. Yeah, I, t I totally agree with you. I, I was looking at this and thinking uh, ab about the entire plan uh, today as I was going through it, and I think it would be worth looking at once we determine what the cost I think Doug has previously said we're going to have about, I'm going to put you on the spot again, about $12 million estimated in the next three years, basically, to bring the level five pipes up to speed, which I think logically that's where we need to focus on. So if we're spending a couple of million now towards that effort, if we can find a way to, if that's $12 million, we're spending about six over three years, if we can find a way to bridge that $6 million delta, if it's through a combination of both maybe taking some of the reserves, which are at about 45%, I think, and then also using some of our bonding capability, but not using all of it so that we're not in a bind. Uh, if something comes up, I don't want to spend all of that $7 million, but I think we should be able to work within those two and at least address the level five issues in the next three years. So that's my thought. Lisa? I would just, again, add that caveat that it might not be the level fives that we're focusing on after we have the new rating system. Sure. Whatever the most pressing. Yep. Okay. So it sounds like if we're good with that, uh, we can direct staff to explore options to, one, determine what that cost is, and two, look for ways to bridge within our bonding and our reserve, a combination of those two without maxing out our reserve, or, um, our bonding capabilities. Great. Okay, well that takes us down to recommendations. Uh, recommendations one and two I think are pretty tied together in my mind, so let me know. Um, but it's the idea of creating a citizen's budget task force and then also tasking them to look for a 3% overall reduction in the 2021 budget year. I will open it up for comments. Lisa. This is just a question. When you say 3%, so based on previous council meetings, I think we're all in agreement that public safety, we're not touching. Public works, we're probably not touching because that would be counterintuitive. And then also, um, oh, what was the other category? Oh. Uh, no, 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 I'm thinking of a department. Okay. Well, anyway, safety and public works, we know that we can't touch. And that leaves us about 60%. No, that takes about 60% of our budget by my calculations. So are we saying that we want the 3% overall reduction to really come from this remaining 40%, which would be a pretty significant reduction? For that remaining 40 percent if we're trying to get it to that three percent overall reduction did that make any sense yes yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah it did <laughs> oh, good yeah mike please the way i 
thought about this when we were writing it up was that, like you said, you got the 60% that it doesn't make sense to take away from. And so it would be the 40% that's remaining, those department had come back with 3% of their total budget in reduction. Right, because I think at the end of the day, we're not going to find a hundred to hundred and forty million dollar pot of cash anywhere. But we were we were trying to come up with ideas from multiple areas to chip away at this much larger number, and whether that meant some bonding, um, some use of our reserves, potential uh, decrease in budget in other departments, and that maybe these together would would be enough to add up to save it. And so this would would have been a piece. I had, so when I first got this, as I was preparing for the meeting, I had Maureen, uh, who is happily retired now, I'm sure, uh, <laughs> pull the figures for one budget year, excluding public safety and public works along the same lines. And I believe it was about $845,000. That would be a 3% cut. So, yeah. Lisa. Oh, no. Oh, you looked at me one. like it you was, had some It was police and fire that I had separate in my head. So uh, those were the three things, police, fire, and public works. And, and that number's all fund. So if you go just from the general fund, then it's, it's uh, 612. 612. Okay. So we'd be creating a citizen's task force of, it looks like, about 18 people plus two council members. So 20, right? Is that right? Uh, and asking them to come up with 3%. So... Is that something we want to do? Traditionally, we've come down that, yep, Jim, go ahead. <laughs> well, I, I, I go back to, we've, we've used priority-based budgeting. We started it in 12. I think it served, it served us very well. Um, you know, and, and we can come back down. And, and so, uh, so how do you, that, that's interesting. And, and we ask the uh, department heads every year to come back to us. And there is this thing called inflation. And we have, what, a 2.1% increase in revenues this year. And the budget is 1.7, 1.8% higher than it was in expenditures for last year. And as we know, we don't usually spend all of that. But we go back and ask our department heads to make the best educated guess based on what they know. We got priority-based budgeting. So are we saying, well, let's just go through and wipe out all the fourth quartiles, things we just won't have any fourth quartiles, priority-based budgeting. But, <clears throat> for example, if it was parks and recs, some things in there, well, uh, who takes care, takes care of the cemetery, um, Shawneetown Volunteer, there are all sorts of programs in there, and when you have 288 programs throughout the city, I think the people that are best qualified to make that determination are the department heads who know what is going on within their departments. I appreciate a citizen task force. There's a tremendous amount of information out there. And, and the thing is, it, you don't just come in. <laughs> Budgeting is extremely complicated and complex. And it's very hard to come and get your arms around it. You know, it takes a couple of years for us up here to get our hand arms around it. So I'm not really for this citizen's task force. I, I think advice and things. But again, I think our department heads and, and, and their supervisors have a far better handle on where to come up with it and perhaps task them for looking at, at every... Um, savings possible, but I also think, and I hate to use this term, we're doing more with less. Shawnee <laughs> has been very frugal, and we get a lot of bang for the buck for what we do, and it goes back to the department heads and their staffs. Matt and then Eric. Uh, so, good comments from, from Jim. I, I remember uh, seeing some uh, evaluations of city staff and I think Shawnee's got one of the lowest costs per capita and cost per square mile of, of any city in Johnson County so we, we run a, a pretty tight ship but actually there's something about this concept I want to I just want to kind of flip it upside down a little bit and look at the other side of it and that is we're, we're really hung up on on cutting costs and I think we should 
truly be focused on expanding our tax base through economic development. Um, and then look at using some of the, that additional funding to focus that towards the, the pipe repair issue. For, for me, and it, it's no secret by now, but that whole thing of economic development is absolutely front and center for me all the time. I, I look at what, by example, what Lenexa has in terms of commercial uh, appraised revenues tax from the commercial. I would love to be in their situation and take some of that money to funnel that towards the, towards the pipe. So a little bit the same, but just flipping it upside down and looking at it from inside out. I agree with you. The more business growth and economic development we can have, certainly the larger and more broad our tax base is. So that is more money for all services for the city. So, Eric. Yeah, your comments on both of those, uh, taking Matt's comments first. I don't think there's anybody that doesn't want to grow business. I mean, that's the best way to get increase the tax base is to grow business. But if we continue with our current policy of we get new businesses, they pay no taxes, and it's still the homeowners paying all the taxes, we're not, make, we're not moving the dial. We're not moving the dial at all. And that's kind of frustrating to me. I've been sitting on this council now for four years, and I don't see the dial moving. All I see is more businesses coming in and getting 20-year waivers on everything. And how, do you, how are you going to increase your tax base doing that? You're not. That's just point blank. That's simple math. You learn it by the time you get out of second grade. If you don't have any, if you don't have any taxes coming in from these people, you're actually costing yourself money because we got to provide services to those new businesses coming in, such as Belmont Promenade and the, and over here on West Westbrook Village. That costs us money, and we're not getting much in, on those things. And we're not in, we're not moving the needle at all, guys. So while I agree with your comments, wonderful. I think I'd like to grow business too. That's the perfect solution. I'd like to get off of this where the homeowners of this city are paying 80% of the property taxes, and the and the businesses in this community are paying 20% of the taxes. I think it's a bad split. We got to change that split, and I think that's up to the people sitting up at this dais to do something about that. Um, as far as citizen involvement, I love citizen involvement. I wish this room had overflowing people in it right now, listening to the discussion that's going on tonight. I like community involvement a lot. We got you look at the demographics of this city, and we're loaded. We got some of the smartest people you've ever seen. We got master's degrees, we got doctorate degrees, we got people that make us look stupid up here, and uh, they're willing to contribute to their community. And you know to shut them out. And I tell you what, guys. <laughs> saying the staff can generate the budget and they're the best qualified to do that. Well, that's nice, but the fox also runs the hen house at that point, okay? So you're saying cut yourself? Oh, well, you know, I don't know if I'm gonna cut myself. Sometimes it looks it's good to have another eye looking at those things. And perhaps you might even get a little information from your citizens if you'd listen a little bit. They might give you some feedback. You know, we really don't think that thing you're in love with is that great. Maybe we shouldn't be spending so much money on that. Maybe that's something that could be trimmed. I know you guys love it up there on the city council, but we're not that crazy about it out here in the city of Shawnee. And I think there's some things like that that could happen across the board, and perhaps some savings could be derived from that that maybe we wouldn't have recommended, but our citizens recommend it and think it's a great idea. And I like listening to them. I think that's really good stuff when you listen to your citizens. So, you know, I'm I'm really opposed to what uh, Councilman Neighbor had to say. I didn't agree with that at all. I, I think that the citizens... Getting involved in our budgetary process, I'd love to see it. I'd like to have a lot more people out there in this community that know something about our budgetary process and what we're paying for and how we're spending their dollars because we're going to do a lot better job if they're involved. I, just to Jim in a second, um, I just want to clarify. Uh, I think we do have the best residents in the metro. They are very smart. Uh, that being said, we also have the best staff in the metro, and I don't think that we have staff who are going to evade uh, or keep funds that, that are not being used for appropriate resources. We do make do with less. The staff has done a tremendous job with this budget, as they do with every budget, and I will not listen to uh, any comments to the contrary. I think if we ask them to come up with a 3% cut, they will absolutely come up. They, they As we've seen tonight through this process, they do everything we ask them to do. They go above and beyond. And so I just want to make that point very clear. Uh, I, for me, I, I tend to agree with what Matt and Jim have said. I, you know, I think I love citizen involvement. Of course, we all do. We want to hear from our residents. That's why we're here to represent them because we have the information about the budget. We've been in all the meetings. We're the ones who are the most educated about it. And they elect each of us to be their representative, to represent them in this budget conversation and make these choices on their behalf. Jim. 
Yeah, the one question, uh, you know, again, and, and um, you know, when, when we determined, I go back to PBB, uh, priority-based budgeting, it's very good. It has worked extremely well for us. We have one of the experts in the United States and Caitlin out here. And when state governments and the federal government is looking to come to use this type of budgeting, the thing I would suggest as we go forward might be best is we, we periodically go through and we revise what what they're what am I talking about? We revise the circles or, or the priorities and the priority-based the budgeting uh, of what we have. And I think that would be the ideal place to bring this citizen group in to get the input from the citizens so we put that in what our quartiles and, and what the valuations uh, and, and how we weight things as far as PBB. I think that would be an excellent place for it. I saw Lindsay and then Lisa. I just wanted to agree with the thoughts about expanding our tax base as the way to really provide funding for the additional stormwater and um, infrastructure projects. I think that's going to bring um, way more in revenue than a 3% decrease in our Parks and Recreation Department. Um, also, I think by cutting our park, Parks and Recreation Department and our other city services, I think that sends the message that we're not open for business, that we are shutting down, that we're going in, as opposed to expanding out and looking to bring more folks and more businesses to Shawnee. So I just think it sends the wrong message to a city that is already incredibly um, you know, fiscally conservative, conservative in our spending and does a really great job mm -hmm. with the budgeting process. I also wanted to point out that there's going to be quite a few opportunities for citizen input coming up through the visioning process. So I think we need to make sure we have those opportunities broadcast loud and clear. Mm -hmm. Okay, Lisa. So priority-based budgeting, that was in 2012. Is that something that we have um, scheduled to review? And what is that process? Yep, I'm actually, as uh, Councilmember Constance pointed out, we're actually gonna be trying to include that in our uh, strategic planning conversations. So you have those seven results. And um, we're also planning to include that in our citizen survey as well, getting kind of a ranking. We asked. The governing body to rank those results. We also uh, will include that in our citizen survey as well. And then kind of our uh, strategic planning process will kind of revolve around those seven results. Okay. I, I definitely think that that is the place where there is most value to get citizen input to actually guide the council and the city staff about what we need to prioritize. So um, we definitely do need to advertise that loud and clear that this is the city's opportunity to weigh in on those important prioritization. Um, discussions. The other thing I wanted to say, I'm sorry, did you want to say something else? In about terms it? of those quartile four programs, we could also have that conversation uh, with the council as well and kind of go through those quartile four programs to see if there's opportunities either to eliminate a program or just a reduction in service mm -hmm. uh, for that program that might lead to some cost savings. I'd like to tease out this idea just a little bit that um, the increase in our commercial tax base and the increase in revenue will be able to help manage the stormwater project. Is that something that we as a council feel we need to have a structure around? Like, do we say 50% of revenue that is above and beyond the previous year's revenue, hypothetically, <laughs> that is above and beyond the previous year's revenue will be directed to stormwater management? Does it need that level of detail? I worry some about tying our hands with that just because I think if we grow uh, both business and residential wise, our services are going to need to yes. expand as well. So I want to make sure that we have the flexibility to accommodate public safety and, you know, anything else that might come with growth as well. Matt. So um, I'm going to tie both of those loose ends together there. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that, number one, I think we do kind of need to tease that out to, to have a target. Um, not necessarily a hard goal, though, because as to your point, um, it, expansion comes with cost. But when you have that kind of, if we do this right, we are going to have some extra money to spend, and we ought to have a target that we've teased out. Mm -hmm. And whether that's using Mike's number of, of equivalent of 3% or maybe even something more significant, we would hope something more significant. We should have an idea of what that is, right? You know, 
aim, aim for the stars, hit the moon type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, it's it's worth a little bit of math, I think. And then we can talk. We can look at that in the future and talk about sure. it. Jim. Yeah. Uh, one other thing is, and a lot of what we're talking about here, is, as far as economic and development thing, these are not. Inst don't happen instantly. The name of the game, we have to play a game if we're going to attract economic development. But 10 years ago, or 15 years ago, or 20 years ago, the governing body made some decisions and they gave some people some incentives, like Bear, McLean, uh, the people at Perimeter Park. Um, I, I didn't catch it this time around, but you know, I, I've seen before that each year, certain buildings that it, certain businesses that have had incentives roll off the the incentives cease after the ten years, and then they roll off, and then all of a sudden that starts to hit and include the the tax base. It, it's it's a strategic thing, and if those folks hadn't done that 10 years ago, we wouldn't be seeing the increase in revenues we have now. It's incumbent on the people up here is to make those decisions going forward with economic development and get the best possible deal we can now because we need the revenues. But these are also the revenues that are going to take care of things when uh, we're 75, 80,000 people. We need two more fire stations more police and thing. It, it's a strategic deal. And it, it is a challenge. When I got on the council nine years ago, we we're 22% commercial tax base. I think now we're 25 and a half percent or something, but our neighboring cities are in the thirties and forties. It is just a challenge, but we have to go at it every day and work at it. And it, it's going to, it takes some patience and going and doing more and, and, and efficiencies, but we've always been good at that. And, you know, I would ask the public, please understand that because it is not instant. It takes time, but you still got your services and that's what we're working for. And like I said, if we are only got a 1.9%, 8% increase in costs this year, that is very efficient government and kudos to the staff for that. So I'll, to maybe circle the wagon back around to the budget, uh, tying together <laughs> what Jim and Lindsay both said. I, I think for me that is a, talking about economic development and what's going to continue to grow our city. And I tend to agree that cutting everything as much as possible that isn't public safety and public works is not going to be perhaps the best way to accomplish growing our city uh, and, and make it the most attractive for not just businesses, but residents as well. Uh, so it sounds like we might be close to being able to make a decision on items one and two of the recommendation. Sewer pipes, they're going to come in for sewer pipes. I agree with you, but I don't think it's one or the other. Parks or something. Okay, Keep I'm going to bring it back to the vote, Eric. Yeah. Uh, so I think we're ready to vote on items one and two. So all those in favor of forming a citizen's task force to uh, achieve the goal of a 3% reduction recommendation, say aye. Opposed, nay. 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 I assumed, yeah. Okay, so the motion fails. Moving on, uh, item number three is uh, to bring future planning in-house instead of contracted out. So uh, you have listed here master planning, comprehensive plans, strategic plans, parks master plans. Uh, just a point of clarification on that. I believe the comprehensive plan is the only one that is not currently under contract, correct? Right. And that is 200,000? That's what we've estimated. Okay. So obviously we would go out to kind of an RFP process and, and yeah, that's just kind of a placeholder for the budget out of the economic development. Okay, thank you. Okay, I would open that up for discussion. Uh, uh, yeah, Matt? This is a question of, uh, make sure I understand, this is in reference only to future planning, it's not a, a, a notion to scrub existing Those contracts. that are under contract, are under contract. That would okay. be obviously, right. but, uh, 
I was those, those plans are regularly revised and updated and so on. So, and I had to give some examples of what kind of plans I'm talking about. So, right. there's some in there. And then um, it says, unless there's no resident expertise on city staff, um, I'm not sure I understand how we assess that level of resident That expertise. may be if there's a plan that I haven't listed here. We have, we have the expertise for everything they have listed here. Okay. But if there's some other plan that we haven't foreseen, and we need it, but wow, well, we don't have anybody here. We need ex we need consultants from outside that have dealt with that issue before. Then we may have to consider hiring a consultant for that. But I I don't actually foresee one. But hey, I'm just trying to leave the door open. Something that I don't foresee. Lisa, so part of the value of going through a master plan or a strategic plan, especially a strategic plan process, is to have an outsider take a look at how you are doing things and give their perspective on how you're doing it compared to other places that is inherent in the process. And it's not just about, can this person facilitate a meeting? Can this person put together a document? It really is about um, bringing in those outside perspectives, being able to evaluate your strengths and weaknesses internally, and then being able to apply that outside learning to something that can help your organization. So I think that this really ties our hands a little bit too much. I think that there's value in having that outsider take a look at us. Matt? So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of in the middle on this. I, I strongly agree with Lisa's comments about strategic planning in particular. And I don't, I don't know what our resident expertise is it relates to some of these items like master planning and comprehensive plans. I, maybe staff can weigh in on this and, and offer an opinion. Um, um, I don't think strategic plan is something that we want to internalize for a lot of the reasons Lisa spoke to. Um, Comprehensive plans. I don't know. No one. What's, have you pondered this? Give me your feedback. And, and I can have uh, Community Development Director Doug Allman speak a little bit this, uh, a little bit more about this in detail. Uh, Councilmember Jenkins, I think, brought up some ideas earlier on. You know, are there opportunities to where, um, you know, I think. Once again, I don't mean to speak for you, so correct me if I'm mistaken. But I think maybe it's an opportunity to bring somebody on, kind of part time or for a year long basis instead of contracting it out. Um, kind of bringing somebody in house. Is there an opportunity? I think maybe suggested by staff or Councilman Jenkins. Is there an opportunity to to bring somebody in, kind of more of even at an admin level and administrative assistant level, take off some light duties, let them focus on kind of more the comprehensive plan update. So there's some things internally that we're kicking around. How you know how can we maximize that dollar? Once again, we haven't mm -hmm. put this out for RFP. We haven't you know we haven't had those conversations yet on what that dollar amount looks like. Uh, but I think we're consistently kicking around those, you know, kind of ideas now. How can we maximize uh, that dollar? I think I'll let uh, Doug jump in. But I think one of the things that I think maybe plays to Councilman Larson Bunnell's comments are some of that library of knowledge that maybe we don't have access to. So although from a staff standpoint, I think one of the initial concerns is just that that data library and things that they would have access to from other plans and things. So, but once again, you know, is there some opportunity where we can? kind of stretch that dollar a little bit further. And so, and so. Just to follow up on that, we certainly have staff expertise in planning. We have three staff planners that have their masters in, in planning. We have three that are AICP certified. But I think the, the idea is, is that with our workload, we focus a lot on current planning. We don't have a long range planning division. Uh, but part of that, we do planning studies in our spare time, essentially. We look at uh, analyzing areas of the city that are uh, in need of development, what infrastructure may be available. We uh, lead planning studies for corridors, those sort of things. We, we do uh, overview and review the city's comprehensive plan by state statute annually. But, but the idea of this comprehensive plan, uh, I would call an overhaul, is that the document that we rely on today was written in-house in the 1980s. Um, and it really hasn't been vetted with the public since I've been here. And so my thought was is that in, while we're in a, a strategic planning process, a comp plan is the thing that sets the guideline for development, it's essentially a playbook for future economic development. And so building on the, uh, the thoughts and the vision that comes out of that strategic plan, I think 
taking that comp plan to the next level of setting that playing field for economic development would go a long way. That's essentially why we had that unmet need in our budget. Um, obviously, we will be heavily involved in that process, but my biggest point of that, that unmet need ask was that there will be an incredible amount of, of work to make sure that it's a community plan and not an in-house planning staff plan. And so that's essentially why that was put in the budget and asked for. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. And I would echo the comprehensive plan it hasn't been updated since 1987. And you know, as we have conversations about potential developments uh, with residents, one of the things they bring up is we don't have any certainty and our plan hasn't been updated and what do we want to be and where do we want things to go? And that's all a part of that conversation that I think is um, overdue. So. Okay, Lisa. So <clears throat> am I hearing that a distinction can be made between long-term plans and short-term plans? I mean, could we could we move this mm -hmm. forward and, and, and say, have a vote and potentially say we want to exclude long-term plans from this prohibition, but everything else should really be done in-house, or are we already doing that? Um, I'm thinking from a comp comprehensive standing, uh, planning standpoint, um, this would be a long-term plan, essentially looking at economic development, our future circulation plan, <laughs> In-house, we're already looking at things like right-of-way allocation, uh, maybe re reversing and revising some of our traditional steep street widths and things like that, which will save us money over time. But all of those things need to be blended into one master plan for the community. And, and so it's a long-term plan, but it will have short-term plan elements within it. Um, and essentially what we would do is the vision that's set by the strategic plan, we would have then buy-in from the council, hopefully, to set that vision for development in the future. So that's, that's the thought. So I think to your point, typically the staff does, you're, she's making a distinction of whether we could say we outsource long-term plans, big oh. plans, and then typically we in-house smaller it's studies. It's a living, yep. breathing document. Yep. Once it's completed, it's gone through the process, it's been adopted, it's basically given to us and our expertise, and we would certainly be looking at it on an annual basis. We would be taking it back to planning commission every year. You guys would have weigh in on future land use uh, scenarios. All of the chapters that were within that book are reviewed. We try to review a portion of our existing comprehensive plan um, chapter by chapter every year, whether it be the future land use guide map, circulation plan map, parks master plan map, but, but since we're doing all these other studies, it seems like we need a holding place for those so that it's all in one place and kind of sets the vision and the tone for what we want uh, development to look like. And the nice thing about that too is, is if we vetted this with the public, if there's a vacant piece of ground and we've had a planning process that talks about the major vacant pieces of ground in town, a developer would have confidence to know that what, what's been said on that has been basically blessed at some level whether it be by the residents who live next to it or by the council. And so it gives the, a developer confidence that what they're proposing would not be met with as much opposition as what we've seen in the past on a few projects. Yep. Uh, I, I think I'm perhaps not being clear. Uh, I just want to, I think it's maybe more of a policy uh, statement that I would ask Nolan about that. So typically if we have something that is not a big a comprehensive plan, strategic plan, master plan, if it's an, an in-house study or it's a shorter term study, the current process is to use in-house staff to look at those items, correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I think, oh, does that answer your question? Okay. Sorry. No, you're fine. That's good information. So thank you. Okay. Any other comments on item three before we go to a vote? Okay. Then all of those in favor of bringing future planning uh, in-house rather than contracting out, please say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. 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 Okay, the motion fails. Moving on to item four, uh, which is to begin a moratorium on all general fund contributions to new parks or recreational facilities until our infrastructure is in adequate state is in an adequate state of repair. Just one point of clarification before we start. We currently don't have any general funds allocated for new parks and rec facilities, correct? That comes from the separate parks and rec fund. So the amount that's <clears throat> The Parks and Rec fund in the general fund is for ongoing maintenance and staff operational costs, correct? Correct. Okay. Yeah, so the funding for new facilities comes from those special like, parks and pipes, correct. liquor tax, things like that. I just would say we aren't going to. Oh, okay. 
feature. Okay. So continue our current plan. Continue the current plan. <laughs> I like as, it. As, as it is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm a huge advocate of, of Parks and Rec. Um, everything I've read about the significance of Parks and Rec as it relates to the health of a, of a community and its, its appeal to, to businesses, it's at the very, very top. Um, I'm an ardent supporter of it. Uh, within the context of this, it doesn't sound like we're going to be changing anything, so I'm I'm fine with that. I just I'm I'm just opposed to the, any negative rhetoric as it relates to, to Parks and Rec, and and I don't want to I don't want to seem to take a hit. But if this is business as usual, I'm 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 fine with that. Yeah, it places a cap so we don't go there because during this period of austerity where we're trying to pay, to fix our pipes. <laughs> We're not going to create some new program for another park or something and pay for it out of general funds. That's really all. That's all it does. So we, the, the funding for parks is basically already established through three different streams, as I discussed with, in the earlier comments. So that was a given. But it's saying, hey, we're not. But we're not going to go and dip into our our uh, general fund to fund anything for parks until this situation is resolved with the pipes. And if we don't have anything, that's great. That's perfect. Lisa, Jim, and then Lindsay. So can I, can I get your get opinion about what the adequate state of repair is? What is our target? What does that really mean? And the reason that I'm asking this is we will always have stormwater maintenance yes, needs. Yes, we will. So they continue so to every year. I'm just trying to figure out where, where are we saying that that target is. Yeah, and I think that we have to work that out with uh, our public works folks and no one to decide what that means level is is it everything level three or better or or where are we going to be with that but that hasn't been discussed by any of us at this point so the word that's why i use the word adequate because i don't have any other word to put in there to describe what that level would be that has to be that has to be determined mm -hmm. do we need to even include the second half of that sentence if our goal is to maintain our current practice of not funding new parks from the general that fund practice that's that's not a stated practice this, that's why this makes it this makes it state as that far as I know there's not a state of practice. We will not spend general fund money on it. We were going to spend general fund money on the on the new uh, community center, quite frankly. It was going to work. It was going to be in arrears every year, the first five years, quarter million or more, and that was going to come out of the general fund. So, yes, you may say we haven't, and that's true, and we still haven't because we didn't approve that, but that was on the table to be done. So I'm just putting a cap on saying, you know, we're going to seal that off. We're not going to go there during this period when we're getting our – our infrastructure back in the adequate shape. So. Jim. What I would say about that, um, anything we pass tonight, um, 15th of January, 2020, the new governing body can change it. Uh, this has been the policy. I agree in principle with getting it done. Uh, <clears throat> but it, it, it's an option. We're not using it. And, and obviously, if it became a choice, it would come in front of this body, and then that choice could be made. I don't like, um, I don't like throwing something out of the toolbox, even if it's rusty on the bottom of it, when it's been there forever, and someday it might need used. And again, the next governing body that sits up there can turn around and change it as well. Lisa, I'm sorry, Lindsay. Yeah. Um. I would say I don't. I, I agree with you on not throwing something out of the toolbox, especially as we're getting ready to go into seeking lots of community input. I hate to say we're never going to consider X, Y, or Z. I want to get the residents' input and feedback first, um, especially if they do really come and say parks are a huge priority. We want us to move forward in the a third of a mile from each house. Um, whatever the resident set forth and comes from that process, I guess I just want to make sure we're able to discuss and we haven't set a a rule that we can't look at those options. Okay. Any other discussion on item four before we take a vote? Okay. Then uh, all of those, all those in favor of a moratorium on general fund contributions to new parks or rec facilities until mm -hmm. our infrastructure is in an adequate state of repair, say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. 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 Motion fails. 
And the final is to adopt a resolution recognizing restoration of the stormwater management infrastructure of the city of Shawnee as a priority goal of our budgetary process until the infrastructure can be brought into an adequate level of repair. And you all have a copy of the resolution. I don't know if, Stephanie, can you pull it up on the screen just so our audience is aware as well. Thank you. All right. Any comments on the resolution? Lisa. I really like the spirit of this resolution, and I think it does exactly what we're wanting to accomplish with directing staff, that this is a priority. However, um, I would want a change in the Be It Resolved section. I would want to change the word the to a when we're referring to a top priority, because this resolution is going to be here potentially for years, and we really never know what is going to happen and it is a top priority it is not necessarily the only or the top priority for any given budget year so i just want to change that word to a okay and i would offer maybe even I, my issue with it is this at first i am a little leery because our our resolution would effectively be giving direction to a governing body that could be completely different during the next budget cycle um, but the second Honestly, the second portion of that, be it resolved, uh, is sort of a dill killer to me. Um, so, I don't understand on that. so if we could just have the first sentence. We are talking currently about the final paragraph of the resolution. So, Stephanie, just to clarify, where where is the part that you are focusing on? Like, where does it start? I, I think from even, okay. even though Got other it. proposals may suffer delay, postponement, or non-funding. The non paragraph of any resolution is to be it resolved. I mean, that's the resolution. So, in other words, you don't agree with the resolution, period. So. Fair enough. Because I, I think that final paragraph is uh, detrimental to our other departments, and I don't think it should be all or nothing, as I've said previously. Any other comments on the resolution? Jim? And again, as I stated earlier, um, this, this obligates future governing bodies and typically we don't, we take care of our business, but we can't dictate what future governing bodies are going to uh, do. Yeah, Eric. Uh, a couple comments. One, what Jim just said, Everything we do up here ties down future bodies that come in. Every ordinance we pass, every policy statement we adopt, every single one of them applies to future city councils. And those city councils have the authority to change that if they so desire. So that's a ridiculous argument, and I really will not even accept that argument. That's off the ball. I don't get that one. Of course we can do this. And if they want to change it after January 15th, that's certainly their prerogative to do so. Um, I feel like we've accomplished absolutely nothing. This governing body has sat here and hunkered down and said, everything you want to do is stupid and we don't want to do it. We like the idea of, uh, you know, saying, yeah, it's important, but that, other than that, we don't want to do a damn thing about it. And I'm pretty frustrated right now about that because not one of you came up with an idea. Well, Lisa came up with one idea about uh, at least figuring out where the priorities were on, on our drainage and which is our most severe problems and focusing on them directly with a monthly report. That was a very useful comment, but otherwise, you guys basically offered up nothing. All you did was shoot down any ideas that anybody tried to take out of the box here, they can forget it because we bring it for this body and this doesn't be slam dunk, man. Forget it. We don't go for anything you say. And not only do you not do you do that, but you don't come up with any alternatives. Tell me where you're gonna come up with the money, guys. Now Mickey says we can come up with fifty about fifty million dollars. What's well, about fifty million short, Mickey? Hate to tell you. Where are you gonna come up with the other fifty? We gotta start making some decisions here. We gotta start tightening our belt. Act like grown-ups. And you guys want to kick the can down the road, know a lot about parks and all this kind of stuff. I love parks, too. And my grandkids love parks. And my kids love parks. And everybody out there loves parks. And I put a little comment in there about not funding parks out of the general fund until this thing is straightened out. And you guys go, oh, we're already doing that. And you vote against it anyway. Wow, you guys are amazing. This, is a, this has been an unbelievable experience tonight. Thank you very much. Go ahead and vote your nose and we'll be done. I would just um, like to make a point of clarification, Eric, uh, that actually in the first section, what we all agreed to was to identify the cost of the level five repairs or whatever the ultimate scale is of the worst and find a way to put additional funding in the form of reserves and uh, potential bonding to meet that delta. So I would not say that 
thirteen million dollars in funding towards our highest priority stormwater is doing nothing and throwing our hands in the air. I think we have weighed all of your proposals and and you know you, you can't come into the meeting and say these are just ideas i'm not going to be pissed i'm not going to cry into my beer if they aren't accepted and then when they aren't accepted kind of throw a fit about it because we are working towards some of it that's uh, not the, i think that I there think was compromise we can agree, disagree because sure. using money out that's already available out of bonding uh it was your not, suggestion it's not, not seeking out additional funding we need to have additional funding to get rid of, to sit, solve this problem, and not one person on this council willing to put forth a single idea about how they're going to fund this. So that's fine. Go see the t go see your voters. Most of us are up for election. Knock yourselves out. We'll see if the people appreciate it. Eric, I'm just not going to let you do revisionist history on that. I would say that putting seven million dollars towards city funds towards stormwater is selecting a priority and allocating funds toward it. That could be seven million dollars that could go to any of the other unmet needs, unmet needs that this council has decided tonight should go towards stormwater. So I don't think that it is appropriate or even anywhere near accurate for you to make that statement. Say what you will. I've already said what I mean Fine. to say. Lisa. Um, Thank you very much for both of your comments. I do think it's an unfair characterization to say that we don't care about the stormwater project because we didn't agree with many of the suggestions tonight. What I think that we unanimously agreed with is that this is a priority. We want staff to think outside the box, but that we weren't sold specifically on any of these recommendations. With that, I would like to make a motion that we adopt the resolution with the paragraph amended at the bottom to changing the first sentence to A, top priority for completion and will receive special funding attention and then deleting the rest of the paragraph. So it will now read, be it resolved that the governing body of Shawnee, Kansas declares definitively that the repair and restoration of our long neglected stormwater system be designated a top priority for completion and will receive special funding attention. That was my initial suggestion. I moved. Sec. Okay. All those in favor of approving the resolution as amended? Say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Nay. Okay. Well, I've won against. The motion passes with the resolution amended. Thank you. Okay. So that is the last of the recommendations. Uh, no one, do you feel that we need a, a motion? Or do you have what you need? No, I, I, think, uh, I think we have what we need. And kind of hearing some of the comments tonight, I think there's a few things that we can kind of go back and look at as well. And Stormwater and IT put together kind of a dashboard that I can send a link out for. It's available on our website in terms of that transparency and looking at some of those programs. And also going back and looking at those quartile four programs. I uh, don't want to commit to a date per se, but maybe a council committee meeting kind of looking at that party-based budgeting aspect and looking at those quartile four programs, giving you all an opportunity to weigh in, the public an opportunity to weigh in on, on kind of if is there opportunities to kind of look at that service level uh, for some of those quartile four programs in our party-based budgeting. Great, thank you. Okay, so no motion needed. We will move on to the second item tonight, which is to discuss the appointment process for city boards and commissions. Deputy City Manager Powell will make a brief presentation. Welcome, Stephen. Okay, well, thank you for letting me present this information to you all. Um, I'm Stephen Powell, Deputy City Manager, as you said. Um, I just have about 13 slides that we can go through pretty quickly and then have some discussion about our process. Um, a little bit of background, most of our boards and commissions are established through the municipal code, and most of our actual appointments are recommended by the mayor with the consent of council. The main one that uh, really differs from that is the Parks and Recreation Board where those are recommended by uh, council members um, uh, when they come up. Um, we have a, a whole list of other boards and commissions that are sort of uh, outside of the city that we appoint people to serve on such as like the Solid Waste Management Committee and some of those more regional type committees. Um, we also have a policy statement, PS72, that was included in the packet that uh, we, uh, you all approved a couple of years ago. And it essentially establishes guidelines for the process that we go through when we make appointments and reappointments. Um, the intent was to try to make it easier for residents to engage with the city in that process, um, thereby simplifying it. 
so these next few slides will cover sort of the procedure that we go through when we do an appointment process. Um, every, at the beginning of every year, you all should get a list of all of your upcoming uh, appointments and reappointments for the year. Um, Elizabeth Griffin, our uh, volunteer coordinator, uh, kind of manages this whole process for us. Uh, we also promote our boards and commissions throughout the year through various mediums, um, and we accept applications uh, any time of the year. Um, and those are kept on file for two years. And so once we launched iCompass, which is our agenda management system, it has a board manager module that we also launched. And so folks can go onto that portal and submit their uh, resume and cover letter and answer all the questions that, that uh, we have as part of the process. Um, this is kind of what the online form looks like. They can add as many attachments as they need to. Um, as soon as they click submit, they get a little code that they can go back into after the fact and check the status of the application. Um, they also get um, a automatic notification just thanking them that we've received the application and um, someone will be in touch throughout the process. And so once we get all those applications in, um, you know, those are directed to either the mayor or the appointing council person for review. Um, that individual w would let the city clerk, or in this case, we delegated that to Elizabeth, know uh, if they wish to reappoint the person, if it's um, a reappointment situation. If they do, um, then we would contact that appointee and make sure that they want to be reappointed. Um, and then if they do, it goes on to the slate of candidates. Um, if the governing body member or the appointee does not wish to uh, continue service, um, then it becomes a vacancy and we start the vacancy recruitment process. And so the vacancy recruitment process happens twice a year. And so just naturally, we have two sort of big swells of uh, term expirations generally in June and December. And so this sort of spring and fall process um, just sort of naturally fell that way based on when most of our terms expire. And so we do additional outreach when we have a vacancy. Um, we also give any of the existing applications that may be on file, you know, we keep them two years. So those are all included in the hopper. And then um, after the mayor or council person reviews their list of folks, they would let Elizabeth know who they wish to move forward with. We contact them, make sure they're still interested. And then based on the, you know, that person saying, yeah, I want to move forward, we start building that slate of candidates that then comes to the city council meeting. So that slate comes in uh, June and in uh, November on uh, those uh, council agendas. And this flowchart, hopefully um, you can see it on your screens up there, but it kind of starts with us getting applications through the website. Um, we send you all a list of all the people who are up for reappointment. And then it sort of branches off, um, always ultimately ending at the yellow box, which is a slate of candidates gets presented to the governing body at a city council meeting. And then um, if you want to see that sort of how that process is divided out over the course of a year, Elizabeth kind of works off this little Gantt chart that shows, you know, when she starts the spring process and when she starts the fall price process and how that kind of shakes out each month. Just kind of a tracking mechanism to make sure she's keeping the process going. Um, a couple items that we're seeking direction on is uh, we do have a current slate that was tabled at the last council meeting. And so um, one of the folks who was on that slate uh, has withdrawn. So just would like some direction on how to move forward with uh, the current slate. Would we open it up for 30 days and get more applicants? Does it go to a meeting? Um, it's really kind of up to you all to make that decision. Eric and then Lindsay. No, this schedule looks fine. Just a couple of things I want to throw out for consideration. And I've had some people emailing me about this with some ideas. Some of them sounded like good ideas. Um, 
One of them would be, is there a conflict of interest with the person that's been recommended to the position, which may, if it doesn't prevent a, a, a conflict of interest, maybe it gives the appearance of a conflict of interest, perhaps. We ought to be mindful of that, I think, in, in the appointment process and as part of the review process. And then I was just going to ask, do we do any kind of local agency check or anything on these folks just to make sure we aren't embarrassed as hell that, oops, we just put a guy on here that was uh, <laughs> really not uh, a good person to put on our board. Um, do we do the process like that in the screening at all? Uh, like a background Yeah, check? just a, just no. a quick, uh, you know, Rob could run a just quick local agency check on him or something like that just to make sure something obvious doesn't pop up that we should have at least been aware of. Um, we don't because they're appointed by the council. Um, so that's not been part of our uh, process. It would like be a pretty simple thing to do, and at least you know the guy wasn't, you know, um, yeah. a felon, a wife batterer, or something <laughs> like that, you know. And like, oh my God, we're embarrassed now. We put this yeah. guy on the council. I mean, just some, it would be a simple screening. It would take hardly no time at all to do, and just yeah. be part of the process. And uh, um, that just a conflict of interest thing, or the appearance of a conflict of interest, I think would be helpful. There is no is re uh, requirement in the code for us to disqualify someone for any type of criminal activity that may appear on someone's criminal history report. So you if, don't have to disqualify them, but we can certainly use that as you, persuasive yeah, information. You, could, um, you know, we would. Yes, if it says that on there, it's going to be not so good. So right. yeah. And one of the things that, that I uh, sorry to jump. No, please do. Uh, <laughs> Uh, to talk about is we, we'd have to be very clear on kind of what yeah. those parameters uh, were. And uh, so just thinking about, you know, if something happened in the last six months, is it different than if it happened 10 years ago? And then kind of the severity of that and what, you know, you know, well, we want to know what, what this incident was. Are we going to be pulling some sort of police report? I mean, so it, it can it can circle a lot of different issues uh, in terms of that. In terms of that yeah, but I think you would just be providing information. And yeah, we can body has to make that decision. I agree. Lindsay? I have a couple just process questions. Okay. And I don't really expect you to have an answer right now. Maybe just something for us to consider as we move forward. One would be how does Shawnee compare to other cities as far as interest? So mm -hmm. just to ask, Lenexa, Overland Park, Olathe, DeSoto, when they put these out, do they have 20 applicants or is it pulling teeth to find folks? So how do we compare? If there is a city that has really great participation um, in applying and interest in the boards and commissions, could we learn from what they do? Um, one thought was, are there other organizations that we can look at to help just cross promote? Mm -hmm. I mean, one that I know of is, I believe there's one called the Women's Appointment Project, because often women are underrepresented on boards and commissions, so they kind of help them get connected. Mm -hmm. So just to maybe think a little outside the box so we can yeah. increase participation because I think we'd all agree more folks involved and connected and the process is better for everybody. Definitely. So I'd uh, like to just put that sure. forward as a yeah, we have to think about. We have used, um, I believe it's called the KC Women's Foundation um, to try to solicit um, some other applicants for certain types of the appointments. Um, but yeah, we haven't actually compared ourselves to like one or one of our core cities but i will tell you for instance when i was uh the clerk for the board at johnson county um it it wasn't overwhelming it come people coming in droves and just my involvement with our statewide clerk organization it's something that has always been a topic of concern and in fact in some of our smaller cities in kansas you know they had to cancel meetings because mm -hmm. they can't find people to fill those spots. So, um, you know, I, I would love to get more people interested. And I think having the online portal where you don't have to like mail in a, or email a resume and you can do it all online at home is at least is one less barrier to people signing up to be considered for that type of stuff. So, uh, but certainly something we can pull our local clerks and just see if it's, you know, things that they're still struggling with. I know they have in the past, and that could have changed. And do for we, them. for all the boards and commissions, is it still 13 questions? Is that the, do they still have to do the, the 13 essay um, questions? Is that right? There are a number of questions that they do have to complete. Okay. Um, I think it's 10. 10. Okay. Yeah, 10 <laughs> questions. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're lengthy. Just, I recall yeah. there being lots of questions. I didn't know. <laughs> 
not saying people shouldn't have to answer some things, but I don't know yeah. if that might be a barrier. Cut it down a little bit. Anyway. You know, when Elizabeth did her presentation probably two or three years ago, when she, she sort of talked about the appointment process, but then she also talked about just the volunteer program in general. And, you know, that is one thing that we did definitely take into consideration is the number of barriers um, that are out there for people who do want to either volunteer for a project or volunteer to serve on a board or commission. So I think with, you know, with having iCompass and having it be a little easier to, for the person to do, hopefully that's broken that barrier down a little bit. So. Okay. Um, just a couple of things. I agree with Eric about a background check, and I am glad you brought up the conflict of interest conversation. I think it is worth um, clarifying with the governing body uh, in terms of particularly the planning commission as we move forward, um, what our expectation or intent would be. To me, I view conflict of interest in a different, uh, I think, two forms. Uh, there, there's the conflict of someone who would potentially be appointed who has you know, donated to one of us, for example. Uh, and then there's a conflict of someone who works for someone in the industry. And to me, I think that's different. I, Eric, we've both served on the planning commission, um, so we know what that's like. I think that having someone who has industry experience, having many people who have industry experience on that commission is very helpful because you're going through very dense documents and you're talking about plans and you're talking about building code and on and on and on. And I think having someone with industry experience is good. And in fact, we do have a current planning commissioner who works for a large general contractor. We have a couple of architects. We have a couple of engineers. So uh, we have good representation of industry right now. And I think much like we recuse ourselves if our employers are ever involved, I think we would naturally have the same expectation of them. I think it's actually a benefit, though, rather than a, a conflict, as it were. Yep. Matt. First, agree with the comment about your comments about conflict of interest as it relates to industry is not really a conflict of interest. And I, I Eric, your comment about the, the background check, I think some at some point it's worth looking at. Can I? Please do. Sorry, and once again, I just want to make sure you all are, have the information to make that decision. Just a couple additional comments on that. There's a cost to that, one that you may be all completely comfortable with, but was in the back, I'm going to say 30 to $40 for a background check per person. So you look at that over all of our boards and commissions, uh, the number of individuals that, that could encompass. Also to think about how often you want to do a background check. Is that an annual basis? Is that only on appointment? So just, I mean, so I think if that's the direction I would, I would prefer to kind of bring back a full, so just sure. additional information. And if that's the direction you want to go, great. I just want to make sure you understand there's a cost and kind of some different levels um, of, of comments there. The other option, just throwing this out there, is there could be maybe not the uh, legal term, but kind of a self self uh, disclosure <laughs> on the applicant. Uh, but once again, the flip side of that is there's some states that are actually taking that ability away on job applications even. So that's kind of uh, ban the box. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, ban the box conversation. So even on a hiring application in certain states, when I think it's becoming more popular, you're not even allowed to ask that question during the hiring process. So just mm -hmm. want to give you some additional information. That's the direction we can bring some more information sure. back from you, but just didn't want to, I don't want to come full circle. And we can certainly check with yeah, our I did, core I didn't city see the cost see what they do. 30 bucks is not that bad. And um, I would see it on initial application, not on renewals. Because by that time, you, the person's on the board, you're observing the person and you're they're connected at least. So there's some certain amount of observation and knowledge about their activity. It's not completely, they could still go rob a bank, I guess, and you wouldn't know it. but. Uh, <laughs> It's well, we ought to have some protection there because that's that's a lot of blowback, you know, to, that you could get off at the pass for thirty bucks. I mean, it, it'll make citywide news if you had one of those. <laughs> yes, it has. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I think bringing something back would be great, Nolan. Thank you, Lindsay. I want to, I guess, say I I don't know that I feel great about the background check idea. My question is. What is the problem we're trying to solve? I mean, nothing's really happened yet. Are we going to say if someone? had marijuana on them 10 years ago, they can't be on the board, and I'm making that decision. Um, also, I would say if some, maybe someone really has done something pretty bad, it's a quick Google search. So I, I don't know. To me, it feels like another barrier from getting more people involved. If it's not a problem, I don't know why we need to come up with this additional barrier and an additional cost for the city. Sure. 
And so that can be a part of a future conversation, it sounds like. Thank you. Um, so for the purposes of this, I think what we need to look at now is how we want to move forward with the slate of candidates we have. Uh, it's just my personal opinion. It seems fair to, uh, in my mind, to the folks who have been put on the slate that they get an up or down vote from us. Uh, and, and I know planning is waiting. They're down a couple folks now, and they're going to have some issues to look at. Um, so I would tend to lean towards moving the slate forward uh, for our next meeting. And I know there is that one spot in planning. Um, and perhaps that is an opportunity for us to open it back up for the next 30 days and accept more applications for that position. But I, do, I hesitate to hold all of these appointments up for one vacant planning spot. So are you looking for a motion to advance? I would love one. Right. So move. And let, <laughs> okay. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. Easy peasy. All right. Before we leave, is there anyone from the public who would like to speak on either of these items? Okay. Seeing none, this concludes our, concludes our agenda, and I will accept a motion to adjourn. Move. Do second. I have a second? I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion passes. We are adjourned.